Right, we're right around 100. And when we break it down, that 100 and the, 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 the categories that they put them in, what percentage are usually, what number of those is usually at the fire ground itself? It's usually around 20. There's usually about 20, give or take a few in there, but it usually has something to do right around the 20. And when you look at the NIOSH reports for those 20, a lot of times they deal with us missing and not understanding the building construction that we're getting ourselves into, missing some of the reading smoke and the fire behavior that's going on with the buildings. And I think by paying attention to those aspects of it, I think by educating ourselves a little bit more with that, we can do a little bit better job of keeping ourselves safe and keeping ourselves protected. Why is it so difficult to truly get a good understanding of reading smoke and fire behavior? What's the best way to learn it? Experience. Right, experience. And with everyone around the country, fires are down. 20, 25 years ago, if you missed it at 11 o'clock in the morning and your officer sat you down and talked to you and said, this is what we missed and this is what we didn't do, by maybe 11 o'clock that night, you had a chance to redeem yourself. It's not like that anymore. It's very difficult to get an opportunity once you've made a mistake or once you've missed something to get an opportunity to be able to prove that you've learned from the lessons that happened at the fire before. So if we maybe take a, an opportunity and use some of the videos that are out there and pay attention to some of the mistakes that were made by others without Monday morning quarterbacking and beating them to death, just taking dis uh, th decisions that they made and actions that were taken at the fire scenes that we can watch on videos, sometimes we can learn from the mistakes other people made. Any of the fires that we talk about here and we discuss decisions that were made, whether it's tactically or things that were missed, it's not to in any way, shape, or form disrespect anyone. It's to learn from mistakes that were made and make us all a little bit better. And I think that that's a big part of it. Sometimes we as a firefighter society have a little bit of a difficulty acknowledging mistakes that we made. And I think most of us would agree, regardless of what fire you were on, there were mistakes made, whether it was by you or someone else on the scene. By sometimes acknowledging those and letting other people learn from them, it's helpful in, in a lot of different ways. If you got questions while we're going through this, please raise your hand, ask the questions. If you don't agree with something I say, throw the bullshit flag. Let's have the conversation, let's talk about it. When it comes to tactics, you could have two great guys that have a lot of great knowledge and disagree on how things could be done. Does it mean either of them are wrong? Absolutely not. It just means that there's other ways of doing things. There's not a perfect science to how everything is done. Do we have tactics and strategies that we should be following? Absolutely. Do we have SOPs or guidelines for our departments that we need to make sure we understand and follow? Agreed upon. But building off of that, we can do that coordinated attack. And by having that engine and truck companies working together as a team on the scene, that's what keeps us safe. That's what keeps us out of harm's way. So these are just some of the people that helped put this program together. <coughs> when we look at fire ground operations, if we were to look at this scene from an outside perspective, who would we probably believe the officer is? The guy with his head a little bit higher, right? And why, why do a lot of times do we see that? What, what's his job or perspective at that point? We're looking at the bigger picture when you're in that officer's position, right? When we're on the pipe, what is our only goal and objective in front of us? We're just looking for orange stuff and we're just pushing forward, pushing forward, looking for orange stuff. Hopefully that officer is trying to get a little bit bigger of a picture and he knows when to pull the reins and go, we need to either stop or we need to push a little bit harder and move forward because they're getting the bigger picture of what's going on. A lot of times when the fire service, they try to marry what happens with military aspects with fire ground aspects. And when we look at this picture, who would we probably guess that the officer is with this one? Probably the guy who's up high getting the bigger picture and that's what they're trying to say. I think it's a little disrespectful sometimes, especially with everything going on with our military, for us to compare what we do to what they do. I don't ever remember getting in the fire engine not thinking I'm going home that day. Um, where these guys on a regular basis, they're put in that position. So I think sometimes it's a little unfair 
but just for picture standpoint and perspective, that's what they're trying to get across here. The fire ground is a certain type of battlefield, and we do need to understand what we're putting ourselves up against and being able to break it down and understand what's going on with it. So when we talk about reading smoke, why, why is that such an important aspect of us showing up at the fire scene, especially the first one or two companies on the scene? And the reason why is we, it can help us determine what is going on inside that structure, how much fire is actually going on in that building. Have you ever heard of the bag method? The bag method will help by telling you where the fire's been, where it's at, and where it's going. Why is that so important? Well, you get one of your taxpayer buildings or you get a two and a half story frame. If you know that you have a two and a half story frame that's balloon construction and you got fire in the basement, where's the next place we need to check? We need to get in that attic space and we need to see what's going on in that attic space because it's going to run the wa walls. By us understanding that bag method, it can help us determine where we're going to put our first couple lines. We can predict collapse. Think of the amount of NIOSH reports where we have known that we are in un unsafe buildings. We have pulled our guys out and we have still stayed in collapse zones. There have been numerous injuries and incidents where it's happened where we come out of the building and where do we congregate? We congregate right in those collapse zones and we don't pull the guys further enough back. Sometimes we get a little lackadaisical once we're pulled out, we figure we're out of the building, we're in a safe area. And then we, it helps us decide what type of strategies and tactics we're gonna do, whether we're gonna go offensive, whether we're gonna go defensive when we look at the uh, aspects of what a truck company needs to do, possibly with rescues, who we need to rescue first when we pull up on the scene. If we know that the fire is impinging in this area and we've got someone ready to jump right above it compared to the, the, the guy who's just waving a couple windows down, it makes a big difference who we're gonna go to first with any of the rescues we're gonna do. So with all of that with the reading smoke and the understanding fire behavior, one of the things that's a big aspect of that is the building construction that's going on nowadays. What are the big differences in building construction today as opposed to, say, 25, 30 years ago? What do we see a lot of? Right, the lightweight trusses, gusset plates, all, all those different things. Is it bad construction? No. What, what does it do for all of us for our bigger houses now? We get nice open floor plans. We, we, it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit less expensive for construction on what's going on with these buildings. But when they're put under fire loads, what, what does it do for us? It increases the chances of collapse. and increases the chances of us being injured due to the, the type of construction that they're done. And we're not going to get into a, a great detail about the building construction itself. Um, that, that's, that, that's a separate class, but it's something that we have to worry about as firefighters on the scene. The building's gonna react differently under fire loads compared to grandma's house, compared to the new house that we built today. Also, square footage is gonna be different. Let's think of what square footage for grandma's house was. What was typical square footage of a, of a, a typical Chicago bungalow? 800,000 square feet. And what's typical square fo footage of a house being built today? Right, and you know, you go into some of these uh, posh suburb areas, and you can put two or three of those in some in some of those houses. So it, it changes the way that we have to approach it, and what our fire tactics may have to be. This building looks like one of our regular apartment buildings that that we probably show up to on a regular basis. This is actually um, at a college; it's a dorm room for a bunch of students. But if we just get a basic idea of what's going on in the structure, where would we guess that the fire is in this building? Basement. Right, we got a basement fire. And if we were guessing, where would we probably think the heavier fire load is, in this front window or rear window? Front. With the heavier smoke in that front, why is it that color? What are we thinking is giving it off that color? Mm. Contents. Contents of the building. So this is all re reading that smoke and getting an idea of what's going on. That smoke that's in the rear, now it's just a, a snapshot of a picture, but that could be that brownish color because of why? 
Right, it could be in the structure, or because the lighting isn't real great on, it's just a snapshot of a picture, they could actually be getting a hit in that area. They could have a line working their way towards the back of the building, and it could actually be turning a little bit gray and not brown. And this is just a snapshot picture, but it's something that we do on a regular basis that sometimes we don't even acknowledge. We're reading that building, we're reading the smoke. We just need to acknowledge it, and maybe we need to talk to the younger people that are with us and make sure they're seeing those pictures also. When we talk about combustion nowadays compared to what it was, say, 25 years ago when Grandma's house built, was, was built and it was burning, when we talk about the things that are burning, what are the big differences about the products that are in the homes? All that, what is everything made out of now? And what is, when that burns, what does it do? It burns so fast and so hot that it does incomplete combustion. When a piece of wood burns or grandma's couch burned, you had complete combustion of it because it was a horse here that was filled in the cushions. It was things like that. And when it burnt, it, 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 it had complete combustion. These burn so fast that the fuels don't get an opportunity to completely burn and they fill the smoke. And that's why the smoke is so much darker and thicker. And the way that I like to describe it is if you look at smoke like this, it almost looks like you could take a handful out of it and take a bite of it. And that's that chunky smoke that, that we're getting from these incomplete combustion. So those are things that we have to worry about. So what's the other thing that we call thick black smoke like that? We call it black fire. Because what, what is it waiting for? It has the heat. It has the fuel. It's just waiting, waiting for the correct oxygen mixture to get along with the correct temperature for it to light up above our heads. And those are the concerns that we have to have when it's that thick black smoke like that. Years ago, when I went through the fire academy, I was told, you do not put water on smoke. You wait till you see the orange stuff. What are we teaching people now? What is it, we're, we're telling people to put water on the smoke to keep it below that ignition temperature because it does have the fuel and it does have the oxygen from us entering that front door. So those are concerns that we have to have that we're cooling down the smoke over our head. The four things that we want to talk about when we, when we talk about evaluating smoke is we want to know the volume of the smoke that's coming out of the structure, the velocity that it's exiting the structure, how dense or thick it is, and then the colors. And we broke down a couple of those a little bit already. When we talk about the pressure or the force of the smoke that's coming out of the building, it's got to be relative to the size of the structure. We were talking a little bit earlier today about you take your typical residential kitchen fire. You could have a small kitchen window with heavy, black, pushy, sm pushing smoke coming out of that uh, kitchen window. You'd probably still guess it's probably still a kitchen fire. Contents may be a little bit into the walls and the cabinets are burning. You have a large warehouse with light smoke puffing out one of the bay doors for the building. Which one is more dangerous to us? It's going to be that big warehouse because if we got smoke coming out one of the warehouse doors, that means everything down to that warehouse door has filled with smoke. And that's a bigger concern for us. For the big warehouse fires, what are most of those buildings' construction? Trust. Right. We, we, again, we've got trust buildings, so we have to worry about the, the heat levels that are in those structures. When we talk about the volume, of how much that is being occupied in, in that structure. The size of the structure itself is going to make a big difference and then what is burning. We're going to watch a video later that a Phoenix, Arizona did where they had an empty warehouse that all they did was put 25 pallets into the building. Within 15 minutes of just putting 25 pallets in the building and lighting them on fire, the building roof had collapsed and it was a trust building. There was nothing else in there to burn other than 25 pallets in the structure itself. But within 25 minutes, that building came down. That's easily in our time frames of when we were doing. The uh, sensors that they had in there at floor level at 20 minutes, what do you think those sensors were saying the temperatures were? Floor level? At floor level. Good. It, it was between 70 to 80 degrees at floor level. So you as an engine company in that type of warehouse fire getting told by command or the truck company that things are looking really bad on the roof, what are you thinking as you're making your crawl? 
This is very sustainable. I, I can be here. I feel no heat at all. At 70, 80 degrees, would any of us as an engine company or a truck company working with that engine company inside that building be worried? I think most of us would say no, we, we wouldn't. I think most of us would be comfortable with those conditions inside the structure and we'd be mad when we, when we were getting pulled out of the building. When we talk about velocity, that's the speed at what it's discharged. Sometimes we see smoke and it's just kind of puffing out a window. So other times we'll see smoke and we got a nice roll to it and it's almost being pushed out the window. And we're gonna see a couple pictures later where you're gonna see that heavy push out of the window. If you've got a, 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 a lot of uh, velocity of that smoke shooting out a window, what's that probably telling you is gonna happen soon inside that room or inside that structure? You're probably gonna get a flashover. It's letting you know there's so much pressure and so much smoke inside that one room that it's gonna pop soon. So when we talk about volume, we want to th the big things we want to do is we, need, we want to decide, is this heavy, is this moderate, or this is light? Now looking at this picture, I think we'd all agree this is pretty heavy smoke coming out of the structure since you can't see basically any part of the structure at all. That's heavy smoke coming out of that building. But we also have to acknowledge what size that container is. Do we got a big container or a small container? Because a, a big container with light smoke showing is just as dangerous as heavy smoke showing out of a small container. Where is it coming from? Is it coming from an, uh, a window or an attic window or the entire structure itself, a doorway? When we look at the smokes exiting different parts of a building, say a residential structure fire, we need to acknowledge what size the hole is that it's coming out of. We can't give as much credence to a window that's two by two compared to a doorway. If the same amount of smoke's coming out of both of those holes, the doorway's gotta give us more concern because it's larger and it's a bigger orifice that it's exiting the structure. With the volume of smoke that's coming out of the building, we need to be worried about the fire load. We talked about the Arizona test that they did. There was really no fire load in there other than the 25 pallets in the structure. But most of the things that we're gonna go into, e even if they're abandoned warehouses, aren't gonna be that empty. There's gonna be other things and other items in there to burn. And those have to be concerns for us and the different things that, that are gonna be in there that are gonna be burning. When we talk about the moderate smoke, we're thinking of the rooms and contents are just burning. That makes it a little bit easier for us, makes it a little bit safer for us. If we know it hasn't gotten into the structure yet, it, it gives us a little bit more of a comfort level that we get a little bit more time to find where the seat of the fire is and find out what's going on and what is working. If we pull up and we see light smoke, a lot of times we're thinking of there's just a small amount of paper products or clothes burning in say a bedroom or, or a different part of the house. We all know that pot of meat smell, right? Mm -hmm. How many times have you, have you gone and as soon as, even if it's a three or four story apartment building, you walk in the front door and you can smell it as soon as you walk in and you know it's a pot of meat. And then you can't get it out of your nose for the next two and a half hours. All you can do is smell that pot of meat. But you know right away that differences in smell. We're gonna show a video a little bit earlier I'm sorry, a little bit later, where we're gonna talk about the limited air fires that are going on nowadays. And what's happening with a lot of structure fires, these even for residentials, is you'll see heavy fire and heavy smoke. And then it'll die down because it's not getting that oxygen that it needs. Then we go and we ventilate it by how? We open that front door to give ourselves access to that structure. We open that front door and within 90 seconds, that fire lights up again and we got heavy fire throughout that structure. Uh, New York did part of their studies that they did with NIST and they went back and they looked and they had good aggressive truck guys doing that exact same thing. They were going and they were entering areas of buildings because they thought it was safe because they didn't have any fire, they just had smoke. And they had six line of duty deaths happen because of those incidents. And we'll get a little bit more into that. So with volume and the size of the structure, when we look at the first picture, what, what type of building is this for us? What do we call these? We got a taxpayer building. So what are some of our concerns with taxpayer buildings? I'm sorry guys, I'm half deaf. 
access, right, it's going to take us a little bit longer to get into these structures. So if we're first on the scene as an engine company, we got we to gotta make sure we let that truck company or squad company know we're going to need a little bit extra tools, we're going to need, need to let command know we're going to need a little bit extra time to get into this structure. Once we get into this structure, say this is a hardware store. What are some of our concerns with hardware stores? Chemicals, storage. What does 90% of the basements of every hardware store look like? Right, it, it looks like a hoarder lives there because they got so much stuff jammed in the basement. So there, there could be anything in there. For the upstairs, we gotta be concerned about, are they still being used as apartments? Is it still being used as storage? Or is it a tire place that they got the upstairs loaded with tires? Those are all concerns that we need to have when we pull up and we see this type of building. And we need to be uh, uh, looking at that and reading the smoke that's coming out of those windows. So if we looked at that first picture right now, where would we probably guess that fire is? Second floor. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would go along with that, the second floor. Would anyone have an issue or a problem if we, while we were working on the first floor and trying to get access to the first floor, if we threw a ladder to the second floor, maybe tried to get access to the second floor with a line that way and going in there and working it that way? Would anyone have an issue or problem with that? I think that's a way about going about it, maybe make it a little bit easier for us to get in there. Now, when we look at the second picture compared to the first picture, are we winning or losing? We're losing. Uh, smoke's gotten a little bit uh, thicker. Smoke's gotten a little bit darker. We're definitely filling more holes, probably from some of the windows that we've taken out, trying to do some ventilation. By the third picture, would we think that we're going to still be interior, or are we go probably going to defensive operations by the third picture? Probably going defensive. If we look at the, um, the way that the smoke has changed color, it's definitely got more of that brown in it. And why are the openings of these at the bottom of these windows compared to here? What is, what is that window doing? Why is the bottom not filled with smoke? Right, it, it's sucking that air in the bottom. It's sustaining its own combustion by sucking in air at the bottom and pushing out smoke at the top, which is going to increase the velocity of the smoke. What was that, brother? I'm sorry? It's going to increase your volume of fire as it feeds itself. Absolutely. Um, for the, the, the volume of the, of the uh, smoke that's coming out of the structure, it's going to change depending on the size of the structure. Now, if we look at these first two pictures, I would pretty much guess both of those are balloon construction buildings. They're both frame buildings. With that first one, it, that looks like they've been there a little bit, but we're definitely not seeing a, a lot of smoke. It's a very light smoke. That's probably one we're probably going to try to get with a hand can, get, get an idea of what's going on in the structure before we're dropping a line. That second one, I would pretty much guess we're probably dropping a line, and we've got some type of contents burning inside that, that structure. There's, there's, there's contents burning in there. For the third one, we definitely got heavier smoke. We see we got a firefighter up on the the roof line right here, and that thicker black smoke that's definitely got more of a push, it's not hanging, and those bottom of the windows are open again. When we talk about velocity, we're talking about the, the rate of release. And the size of the structure can have a big influence on the way that the smoke's coming out of the building. Again, we talk about a huge warehouse. We're going to have less of a velocity, even though we could have just as intense of a fire as, say, a residential structure, but just because of the size of the building, it's going to make a, di a difference. If we have wispy, lazy smoke um, compared to being put under pressure, there could be a couple different reasons for that. One of the reasons could be that you're closer to the fire. As smoke cools off, it loses some of its velocity. So it's not going to move as fast. So if we have wind, different windows showing where we have different amount of smoke pushing out the window, we can have the type of situation where we can read the two different windows and say we have fire in this area because it's pushing a little bit harder. The, the more rapid that smoke moves, the hotter that smoke is, the more chance it has to light up and cause some type of flashover to happen. With the velocity, it's caused by the pressure and the heat that's involved in the smoke that's coming from that structure. Um, as the volume of the smoke lessens, as it expands out, it's going to slow down. It's not going to move as fast. As, also, as it's moving through the structure, 
items can take on that heat from the smoke, which is also going to make it slow down and not move as fast. Um, different areas of the building could actually cause the smoke to narrow and go through tighter spaces, which can also slow it down from exiting that structure. This is a picture showing the velocity. Uh, of, this is Detroit. And this is a two and a half story frame where he's exiting from the, from the attic space. And up in this area where, where you're seeing that that triangle is showing, again, it's showing how the smoke is being sucked in through this area to, to help sustain the, the fire and the smoke that, that adding the velocity to it <coughs> as it's coming out the top of that windowsill. And that's something we have to watch and we have to look at. Some of the pictures we'll see a little bit later. What can happen in this smoke when it reaches the correct oxygen temperature on the outside of the building? You ever see any of that smoke start to light up as it's exiting the structure? That's letting you know that, all, that, that smoke that's coming out of the structure is just waiting for the correct oxygen level for the temperature of that smoke that it is. The reason why it's not lighting up inside that structure is it's not the correct oxygen and it's probably too rich. Once it exits the building and it starts to expand out, it gets to that correct heat, fuel, and oxygen level. Again, this is another two and a half story frame. We got heavy fire in that attic space. With this type of building, with a fire up in that two and a half story frame, what's one of our concerns about that attic space? What could it have up there that's dangerous for us? Knee walls. Knee walls. And why are knee walls so dangerous for us? There are numerous NIOSH reports that have happened where your engine company does a good aggressive move. They make it up the staircase, they get to that attic space, they make a great push from the staircase all the way to the window. They got heavy heat and they got the line open and they're not making any progress. They're at that windowsill all the way at the front of the building now and you get a good aggressive truck guy who comes upstairs and what does he do? He starts opening the walls like he's supposed to. But we've already got the engine buried in, on the other end of the attic space and now they're caught on the other side of where the fire is. It's important as an engine company that when we go to make that staircase upstairs, we can keep that line open, but we need to make a hole in those knee walls on each side of us. And when I say a hole in a knee wall for an inspection hole, I don't mean a hole. I mean a hole. Because we want to be able to contain it with the line that we have. We don't want to have to be able to back, have to back down the stairs again. So if we're able to make a small inspection hole, we got heavy fire in there, it's something we can contain and control from the spot that we're at. Now as we're working our way down, we can keep making inspection holes and putting out the fires in case that it's sectioned off as we go through the upstairs area. This video always makes me laugh because I love this guy on the second floor. There's not a lick of smoke in the, on the second floor, and he's breaking out all these windows. So for density, when we talk about density of the smoke that's coming out of this structure, um, it lets us know how well combustion is going on inside the structure. If the temperatures are at such a point where we're getting incomplete combustion and it's going to make that smoke a little bit thicker. When we talk about fires being hotter now, what do we mean by that? Sometimes I think when they say that fires burn hotter nowadays, I think it's a little, uh, 
misconceiving on, on what is actually going on because do they get a little bit hotter than they used to say 25 years ago? Yeah, they do. What the concern is though on how fast that they're doing it. When grandma's house burned say 25 years ago, for a room to reach a flashover, you were closer to 20 minutes. For a room to reach flashover now, how long does it take? Three minutes for a room to reach flashover, your typical eight by 10 room. So there's a huge difference there in, in what's going on and what's happening. So th those are the concerns when they talk about it getting hotter. But when we talk about the incomplete combustion, when that incomplete combustion happens, that's the smoke that's over our head. And that, those are the concerns that we have to have. Those thick particles not yet on fire above our head, we have to keep below ignition temperature. And how do we do that as we're advancing that line? Cool. Right, we cool it down. We open that line as we're making our hallway and we cool it down. And th those are important things to remember. smoke that's shown in, in these two slides, we're talking about, the, we're still talking about the density of them. And it almost gets that inky or, uh, the other way it's been described to me is cotton candy looking, where it's kind of shiny almost on the outside. And that, that's letting you know that, that that is truly ready to light up as of right now. In this picture, and I don't know if you can see it from where you're at, you're actually getting a few licks of fire starting to roll out that window there from it reaching that correct oxygen level at, at the scene. Uh, I don't know if you can see here, but what they're actually doing is they're bringing a line up this ladder and they're actually going to put it into that window there to, to kind of cool it down a little bit in that attic space. Is there anyone that feels that that's a wrong move? Well, it, it, absolutely. It, it absolutely <coughs> depends on the situation. For this small attic space, and I don't know if you can see the, what we're looking at here, but it's probably a nice wide open space and th there's heavy, heavy fire in, the, in there. Would we as looking at that small little attic space from the outside, would we think that there is a chance that anyone is survivable up in that spot? So if we can cool it down just a little bit for that interior engine company and bring those temperatures down so when they make that staircase, they, they can make that turn to get up in that attic space, attic space, would that be better off for all of us in the, in the long run? Yeah, but by putting water into that window, you're going to be pushing everything back down the staircase where it's coming up from. Well, and, and, well, and, it, well, and we're, going to, we're going to talk about the proper ways to actually do um, that transitional attack so that d doesn't happen. And you know, what? Ceiling, right? I mean, if they're just shooting it at the ceiling, it would be, it'd be well, a bad idea. Well, you know, these, the, all these new reports about the NIST, about this transitional attack, about hitting it from the outside, we'll, we'll hit that real fast while we're doing, while we're talking about this. Um, one of my concerns was when all these studies first came out was actually that, and they would say, you can't push fire, you can't push fire. And I'm not arguing with pushing fire, but what hurts not only us but the civilians? Is it the fire when stuff like that happens? No, it's the heat and smoke. That's what cause, causes the injuries. One thing that they did find out, if we do a transitional attack properly, then we're not going to push that heat and smoke back on to the people that are in there. When we talk about doing a transitional attack, how long should that line be open from the outside? 5, 10, no more than 15 seconds. The idea is to put some water in there. The important things about doing that is angle. We should start at the angle from one end of a window sill. So if this is our huge window, it should come in at this angle and shoot towards that angle of the ceiling, and it should hit the ceiling. The big part about it is, does that line move or do we keep it still? We keep it still. And the reason why we keep it still, because even it, at, if we have an inch and three quarter hand line, we have a huge window, and just doing this with the line, it causes 60 to 80% of the rest of that window to be uh, unavailable for, act, for the exit of that heat and smoke that wants to come out of that window. 
So we keep it still for that 10 to 15 seconds. And what they found out, if we do that, and we follow those basic rules, we will not push that heat and smoke back on to the, the people that are inside that structure, whether it's the civilians or it's the, or it's the firefighters inside the structure. Now, I have an issue if we are going to do a transitional attack, who should do it? It should be first engine. First engine should do the transitional attack. If someone else is going to do it, if he's the engine company that's inside the structure and the chief tells me we're going to do a transitional attack, there has to be a communication that has to happen. We have to acknowledge each other that they are in a safe space. They're not sitting at the top of the stairs and we're going to try that transitional attack and we're going to do it if, if, if the second engine company or someone else is going to do that. There has to be that communication that has to happen and it has to be acknowledged. If he doesn't answer, he didn't turn on his radio, do we do it? Absolutely not. We don't, we don't do it at all. And th those are the important things that have to happen with the transitional attack. One of the things that, I, uh, when, uh, that Steve Kerber, who was real big into the NIST thing, when he came around and did the class for us, I beat him to death on, was that it, when you look at the videos that they show for those NIST studies, all the videos are horrible. It's not properly done as, a, as the way that the line's supposed to be let out and, and put in through the window those seconds and he, he agreed that with the videos but what does that do for firemen it's showing us the wrong and bad ways to do things so we have to, we have to pay attention to those two the other thing that happens with firemen when we throw water in through a window with a fireman if 10 seconds is good two minutes is better, two minutes is better. <laughs> absolutely and if he's going to do it he's going to throw 500 gallons in there i'm going to do it too because he's not going to get more than me I'm a big fan is if you as an officer feel you want to do a transitional attack and you're going to ask someone to do that, if you don't stand like this right behind the fireman ready to smack him in the head, tell him to turn off the line, a lot of times they can't stop themselves and they just want to put more into it. So again, it's no more than 15 seconds. One of the other problems with transitional attack is if he's my officer, we got a three-man company. He tells me we're going to hit it from the outside. I take that line, I hit it from the outside for the 10, 15 seconds. Now he says, all right, we're gonna go and we're gonna go to work. I put down the line, I put my mask on, I put my hood up, I put my helmet back on, I put my gloves on. Now we're getting our, our ready to make our way to that hallway and make our way up to that second floor. What sometimes happens by then? It reignites, it's right back to where it was. So it's not a bad idea that the person who's going to do the transitional attack, if it, if, He's the officer, it's not a bad idea. If he hits it for the 15 seconds while he's doing that, if I'm throwing my stuff on, now I'm ready to go and he can feed the line up the stairs while I'm putting my stuff on. That way you're, you got that movement going, you got everyone actually working and you're not having that pause or that, that time frame uh, where, where you're not getting water to the seat of the fire. Is that makes sense? Does anyone disagree with, with any of that? Because we'll talk more about that if, if we do. Okay. So with this color smoke that's coming out of this window here, what's probably going on? They probably got a little bit of a hit on it. They're probably on that first floor, and they haven't made their way up to the second floor yet to work where the fire is. My guess is with they're showing fire down here in the basement, they probably have a line down there. All, they're all, we're working their way down there also. So we talked about this. The more dense the smoke is, the more dangerous it is for us. The more particles that are in there, the more chance it has of flashing over or lighting up. There's that cotton candy look like we were talking about. <coughs> so for your colors. Now, for most of our households, we don't just have one product in there. But this is an overall picture of what we're probably going to be able to see when we pull up on, on a building, when we have that light gray smoke, we're probably looking at so something like clothing burning or papers or materials along those lines burning inside the structure. For furniture, we're looking at more of a dark gray. For your rubbery contents or any of your plastic furniture, you're looking at that dark gray or the black. That's what we're seeing mostly of. Where, for your low income housing, where are most people getting their products from? your Ikeas, your Targets, your Walmarts, your things like that, and everything's made out of that plastic, plasticky, rubbery uh, material. 
For your wood structures, when, we, when we're actually starting to get into the wood elements of the building, we're looking at the brown, and we're looking at the complete development of the structure itself. It's that very dark, almost black. So for your, your color of your materials, you've got your paper or your cloth, your light gray, and that's what we're seeing in this top picture here. A very light smoke, it may be something like a bed burning in a bedroom, or just some clothing or material that caught on fire from smoking. So we're going to see that light smoke. We might go in with hand cans, we might actually drop a line on that right away and get in there and try and put it out. The lower picture is showing your furniture, where you're getting that darker gray that, that's showing in the smoke. For your top one there, we're looking definitely at contents. You can actually see the fire burning, the color of the smoke um, th that, that we're seeing definitely gives off the, the telltale signs that it's contents burning. But with this lower picture, what are we thinking here? <coughs> it's probably already in the structure itself. We, we, it's that heavier, thick black stuff that's pushing out and you, you got a nice little suck at the bottom of the windows here going on, letting you know it, it's feeding itself the oxygen it needs. As smoke's moving through the structure and it's going through different areas, it can actually clean dust particles because it's so thick, it can pick up stuff as it's moving through the structures. They've had incidents where when they pulled areas off that haven't been opened in years, instead of them being dusty, they are actually swept clean by the smoke that ran through those, some of those concealed spaces. Definitely too unsavable with the church and the roof burning off of it. We've got to worry about those collapse zones and that thick, heavy black smoke. And that bottom one is just a total loss. There's nothing left of that building at all. So for that second floor bedroom, the th concerns that we have to have is we have to be ready and we have to be concerns for flashover. As we're making that hallway, it's important we open up the nozzle and we cool that hallway down. We make sure that we keep the area that we're moving forward in safe. As the uh, pipe or as the, as the company, the engine company that's moving down the hallway, we have the answer and we have to get that, make that turn into that bedroom or into that front room area to be able to put out the seat of the fire. For size ups, how realistic when you have multiple rooms burning is it to give a size up of reading smoke inside a structure? It's not very easy because all you're just loaded with black smoke throughout the structure when you have multiple rooms burning. When you have one, maybe two rooms burning, can that smoke give you some telltale signs inside the structure, what's going on or what's happening? If you're making your way up the upstairs stairs and you make a left instead of a right and the smoke <coughs> clears up, what's that telling you? I went in the wrong direction, right? We can use our hand light and see which way that smoke is pushing. If the smoke is pushing to the left, I should probably be going to the right. That's probably telling me where that fire is. So those are little things for a one or two bedroom fire. We can read that smoke inside the building. But how many times have you seen, especially with the YouTube videos, where the guys say we're winning on the inside, we're winning on the inside, and they're showing the video from the outside, and what does it look like? Right. It's burning through the roof. The, the, the whole roof's on fire. There, there are different things that, that are going on with the structure. For me personally, I have a little flashlight that's on the top of my helmet, and it's not to see. What that light tells me is, as we enter the structure, what's usually the smoke conditions, it's heavy. As things, and we start winning, and things start lifting a little bit, if I start seeing it bounce off things, I know that we're actually making, we're making progress, we're winning. We're, we're moving forward, and we're, we're getting somewhere with it. We have to be worried about those concealed spaces, especially with a lot of the buildings now. Um, because the economy is so bad, they're taking single-family homes and they're moving three, four families sometimes into single-family homes. They'll add walls that aren't supposed to be there, which will build you concealed spaces. Think of the, how many of the fires or businesses that you've been to that have two, three different ceilings for the buildings that, that you're in. So th that can have a, a change in what's going on with the structure where on the inside of the building, you're thinking it's fine, but from the outside they're seeing something completely different. When we look at the pressure shown from these two bu buildings and the, the smoke that's coming out of it, the first one on the left here, 
When we look at this one, is that smoke pushing or is it just kind of hanging? It's just kind of hanging. I would guess that be due to the color of it, we're probably getting a hit on that. It's probably on that floor and we're getting a hit on it. And if you look at the picture on the right, the way that I, I view this picture, and again, it's just a snapshot picture, but I would guess there's probably a staircase right here because it looks like this smoke's coming up on an angle. And the smoke is thicker, there's more push, there's a little bit more velocity to that smoke. It's a deeper in color. I would guess we haven't made it to the seat of the fire yet for that. Weather conditions can have a big effect on what that smoke is doing on the outside of the structure. When it's a humid day outside, it'll actually make the smoke hang a little bit lower and sit in front of the building. When we have those cold, dry conditions outside, sometimes the smoke will appear more of a white because as it's exiting the structure, because it's so cold outside, it's losing a lot of that heat, which makes it rise a little bit faster. And then what have we noticed with sprinkler systems? What does it do to the smoke when we're inside these structures, especially these big warehouses where sprinklers are going? What does it do to the smoke? It pushes it down and hangs it low right at eye level so we can't see anything that's going on or what we're doing. Time of day can have a big factor on what that smoke is doing. Uh, if you look at this smoke here, can you truly tell what color it is because of the time of the day? It's very difficult because it's dark outside to be able to break down what color that smoke is. Also, the lights that are in the area, whether it's off the apparatus or it's the street lights, can change the colors and the effects of what's going on with the smoke and what's happening. Most times when we're reading smoke, it's usually taken us about five seconds and we're doing it and we're probably not even acknowledging how much we're doing it and, and what things that we're talking about or seeing with the smoke that's going on. But realistically, it takes us about five seconds to break down what that smoke is doing. It's important that if you're seeing changes in that smoke, because we should be reading that smoke constantly throughout the structure. If you're sent to Sector uh, 3 or Charlie to open up the rear of the building, it's important that you express if you see a change in conditions to command or the units that are inside of that structure so they know that they're either winning or losing with what's going on. When we talk about vent enter search, what is the reasons that we do a vent enter search? Right, we, we have a known victim for that room. Now the concerns that we have to have with a known victim is you pull up on the scene and someone says, my baby's in that room. Is that enough information to go off of? What's that? No. No, right, because if I tell him my baby's up in that second floor room and he goes up there and finds a poodle, how happy is he gonna be when he comes downstairs? He's gonna be pretty upset. He goes up there, and he finds a 35-year-old man. Maybe that is my baby. Maybe that's my son. So sometimes we need to get a little bit more information for the vent and a search before we commit ourselves to doing it. How difficult is it for one person to do a vent and a search? Realistically, when you do a vent and a search because of Murphy, how big is the person gonna be? They're gonna be at least 300 pounds. What's grandma going to be wearing? Nothing. Right, or, or a nightgown that's going to pull right off her. And because of the heat conditions that are going on in this structure, when you grab her armor or you grab her, what's going to happen to her skin? You're going to dig lover. All right, so everything's going to go wrong when you try to do a vent enter search. The other things that they found out with the vent enter search, because you're throwing all your gear on, you're throwing a ladder, you're breaking out the window, you're then entering inside the bedroom, you're beelining to that door so you can isolate it and make sure that door is shut to buy yourself a little bit of time, and then you make it back to whoever you found on the floor, and you're pulling them back to the window. How many shots do you get, them, get to get them up on the windowsill? You're getting one shot, and if you don't get them up on that one shot, it's probably not going to happen by yourself. You're not, you're not going to be able to get, a, to get up the energy to get it a second time. How long for a vent enter search after you shut the door should it take you to search that room? Right, we're talking 15 seconds to search that 10 by 10 bedroom. If you're not getting that person out by then, it's time for you to beat feet and get out of there. 
if possible, when we do event under search, you throw the ladder to the rear of the building, you break out the window, you make entry into it. Your engine company does a great job. They get up that staircase, they cool it down, they've worked past you. Is it better that we take them down the interior staircase? Yeah, Absolutely. You don't want your 15 minutes of fame being dropping grandma down the ladder. If you can bring them down that interior staircase, is it safer for us? Yeah. Is it safer for them? Absolutely it is. It's very, very difficult to have that situation where you're trying to bring someone down the ladder, especially if he's trying to hand her off to me and it's not something that we've practiced in a while or we've done. If I'm not in the correct position for how he's bringing that person up, we can actually drop that person. Depending on the size too, it can make it very difficult for how we're bringing that person down. So when we talk about the temperatures of the smoke, and as the smoke moves further away from the burning, burning room itself, it's going to actually start to cool down. If we see what directions, like we talked about with the hand light, which way the smoke is going, or how thick or thin it is in those areas, it can give us an idea of what's going on and how things are, if we're getting closer or further away from the actual room that's burning. So we need to pay attention to that on the inside of the structure and what, what senses that we can use to get an idea of what's going on. This is a little cheat sheet that is a little helpful when we look at smoke coming out of a doorway. When we have a little smoke and it's high above the, towards the top of the door, that lets us know the fire's probably on, on the floor above us. If we've got moderate that fills up half to three quarters of the door, we'll probably have a fire on our level. And if we have a fire in a basement, it's probably gonna fill up the whole doorway. Is that always correct? Is that always the way it's gonna be? Absolutely not. But it gives you an idea of where to check. Go ahead, take 10, guys. Hmm.
Do we know what town this is a picture of? Homewood. Homewood. And the reason why we added to this because I think there are important le some important lessons that we need to learn from some of the things that happen here. The biggest reason why I bring it up is because I think a lot of, a lot of the conversation that happens with this. I think the first company on the scene takes a huge beating, and I think it's a little unfair. Um, we're going to look at a couple uh, fires uh, besides this one where the exact same decisions were made that were made in this one and nobody died. And they might have lost the house and bad things may have happened, but nobody died. So it's not that crazy in some of the decisions that were made here. When they were dispatched for this, what were they dispatched for? A residential structure fire with a person trapped on the inside of the structure. What's the thought process for all of us when we hear that? What mode do we go into? Hurry up. Right, we go into hurry up when we're thinking rescue before we even get on the scene. When they pulled up at the scene, they had fire in sector three. They had a woman on the outside of the house who said my husband is inside that structure. It was a small ranch style home. They pulled a two and a half inch line. Now, we can agree or disagree that maybe they should have gone with the inch three quarters, might have been easier, especially for inside a residential structure. Whatever it is, it is they chose to take a two and a half. Their policy for their department is the officer on the engine company, instead of going inside the structure with the company, the most senior guy stays outside and takes command. Again, we can beat that to death on whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent. He followed what he was supposed to do. He stayed outside and, and took command. The ambulance crew met up with the engine company. They enter the structure. They get about 12 to 15 feet into the structure, and it's hot. The person who is the most senior did not put his hood on. Told Brian, who was on the pipe, keep penciling. I'll be back in a minute or two. Shot outside, he was going to put his hood on. Now, what is penciling? Short little burst with the pipe. Short little burst with the pipe. And when do we use penciling? For years, we were taught we can use it when we lack water. We were told when we can't find the fire, we were told if we want to cool down a little bit of the area above us. Penciling was taught, I know, I know to me, as that was the tactic to be used. I've never heard of it. You know, you, it all, all it is is short little bursts yeah. as you're doing. It, and you probably have seen or, or heard it done and just didn't call it penciling. But it, it, it's a very common practice. One of the reasons why they went away from penciling is because of the way that combustion has changed. And what they found out that is if you pencil and give it a short burst, one of the reasons we used to do it was it gave us an idea of what was going on in the area that we were in. If we were in a hallway, you shot water in the air. If it came down superheated, you went, it's really hot above me. If it came down ice cold, you went, it's fine. If nothing came down at all and heard, all you heard was shh, you knew it was really, really hot. So it gave you an idea of what kind of position you were in. But what they're going away from is the penciling is because if it's hot above you, five seconds of water isn't enough to cool down that area above you. When we were taught through the fire academy, we were taught we do not put water on smoke, right? Now, what are they teaching everyone? We cool down that smoke to keep it below ignition temperature. Brian was in there and Brian was doing his pencil. He had a two and a half inch line. 
did his penciling. There was a company in there, and I don't remember where the truck company was from. If someone else does, please speak up. Hazelcrest. Hazelcrest. They went in there, and they were doing a search. They realized it was getting bad in there, that it was time to leave. They screamed to the engine company, it's time to go, let's get out of here. They made their way out. Brian put down the hose line and tried making his way back to the door. I think he made it within six feet of the door. Kira, I believe her name was, I think she made it within three feet of the door and they had to peel her off the carpeting because she was stuck to the carpeting when it flashed over. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of Ray McCormick, but he's a lieutenant from New York. He goes around the country and he speaks at a bunch of different places. And one of his big concerns with engine company operations is how does it happen where guys on the pipe die in the line of duty? Let's ask this question here. You've got a 10 by 20 room, nice size room, 10 by 20. With an, we won't even use a two and a half inch line. With an inch and three quarter hand line, if you take that line, you open it all the way and point it at the ceiling, will that room flash over? No. It's impossible. I think we would all agree that room will not flash. You might get burned. You might have second and third degree burns, but you'll come out of there telling the story. When Brian put down that line and exited for the door, we all think we got time. We got time. We got time. How long does it take me to call, crawl 12 feet? How long does it take? How long does it take? and it lit up on him. Never made it outside. We talk about our gear, our gear ratings, 1600 degrees, 1400 degrees. Our air pack mass, when do they fail? At 400 degrees. At 300 degrees, they start to get the plastic wiggle, and we all know what I'm talking about with that, right? At 300 degrees? You, you get that little wiggle where the plastic starts changing colors and you're not able to see through it as well. So even if our gear is rated at 1600 degrees, it really doesn't matter if your mass fails. One of the things that is difficult to do is to back out with a line. And if it's not something that we practice on a regular basis, would anyone in the military, when they were running for the hills and they were retreating, would they ever drop their guns and run for the hills? No, they wouldn't. They would take their guns with them. And that's what we need to do as being that engine company. If we decide we're in a bad area and we're backing out, if we've decided it's bad, then we need to take our guns with us and we need to back out with that hand line. If we're ever in a position where things are getting bad, if we open that hand line, we can at least cool it down enough where smart decisions can be made. Brian didn't do anything wrong. Brian did exactly what he was told to do by everyone that he was told to do it. Brian had, what, two years' experience? For Homewood, not a, is it a bad fire department? Absolutely not. Is it bad guys? Absolutely not. They didn't have a ton of fire. So how much experience did Brian have under his belt? Brian didn't have a lot. Brian did what he was told to do. He was told to pencil. He penciled. He was told to take the two and a half. He took the two and a half. He was told to wait for his officer to come back. He waited for his officer to come back. He was told to ditch the line and exit the structure. He ditched the line and it tried to exit the structure and never made it out. He did what he was told to do, and that's something that we need to talk about as senior guys at the scene of a fire. We need to make sure that our guys on the pipe know that if we open it up, we can make it better. For everyone inside that room, we can make it better. We can bring down those temperatures to a point where it's survivable. If that room flashes, we're done. We're, we, we are, we are, we're done, that's it. So if we open that line, we're capable of keeping it where it's survivable. They get beat to death because they didn't take that line to the rear. They didn't take the line to the rear. They didn't take the line to the rear. The training that we do and the way that we do it a lot of times dictates how we're gonna do it at a fire scene. For a couple years I played police officer and when I went through gun school, they showed a video of a police officer with a gentleman. The gentleman pulled out a gun on the police officer. For this police officer, it was really no big deal. Through his training, his six months at the police academy, every single day, 20, 25 times a day, they had an instructor pull a gun and take the gun away from the instructor and hand it back. He did that excellent move. 
The guy pulled a gun, took it away from him. What did he do 25 times a day after he took the gun away from his instructor? What do you think he did with the guy? It's muscle memory. If we don't practice on our drills, if we don't practice on our drills taking a line to the rear, is that thought process going to happen for us at the real incidents? We're going to do what we train. 90% of the time as firefighters, where do we take the first line? We take it in through the front door. Why? Because it's usually the door that's open. It's usually the door that's least amount locked. It's usually the easiest access. It's usually where the staircase is. It's the easiest access for us to obtain entry into that structure. Would they have been wrong by taking a line to the rear and maybe throwing 150 gallons of water on the, on the back of this fire? Absolutely not. Can I beat them up because they went into rescue mode and decided to try to make an effort to make entry into the structure to do a rescue? No, I can't. Uh, one of the classes I did, we did this class Saturday in another department. And one of the gentlemen there said, well, if they would have gone to sector three, they would have realized this guy had no chance of living. Do you want me pulling up to your house no. and telling you that your family has no chance of living? Or do you want me to try to make the effort and do the rescue? I, don't, I wouldn't appreciate if you pulled up at my house and said, your family's dead, we're, do, we're doing it this way. I want you to make the effort. That, that's kind of what we all sign up for. So I can't beat them up on them trying to do an interior attack. Would, I, would it have been maybe a good idea to drop two, one to the rear, throw some water on it, and then make entry? Yeah. There are a lot of different tactics that could have been done with this. But the biggest thing that we need to talk about, when we do burns at burn towers, do we use penciling? Absolutely we do, because what do we want, not want to do? We don't want to put that fire out because it's too hard to get relit again. We don't want to have to bring new stuff in there and, and dry it all out. So we kind of give it some quick bursts. Sometimes we need to talk about that with the people that we're training. Is this what is what we're doing in the academy, but in real life, you have to open that nozzle and you have to put the fire out. You've got to make it to the seat of the fire. So th those are just some, some different things that with this incident. This picture was taken not too long after this gentleman here broke out this window to help try to do some ventilation. The measurements that they said they took with this smoke coming out the side window is it was pushing out that, uh, that B side six feet out that window. What kind of push and what kind of velocity is that if it's coming straight out that window at six feet? That, that, I mean, that's intense. So what do you think that that building wants to do? It's going to flash. That color of the smoke, that thick black smoke that's going on inside that structure. You've got four people in there, and you've got a window that's pushing out. If you see that, if you're the outside vent man, and you break a window and you see that, is that something we need to be talking about on the radio? Is that something we need to let everyone know that this is what, what we're seeing? As an engine company, if it's hot, cool it down. If you're making your way in there and it's hot, cool it down. If we can't move forward with that engine company, we lose, period. We've lost. If we are the ones with the guns, that engine company has the gun. If they cannot move forward and we cannot keep the area cool and we are, we are caught in a place, we either got to decide two things. We either need to figure out a better plan or we need to exit the building because we're not winning anymore. We have to move forward. And if we stop moving forward, then we're not winning. If we're not making progress on the inside of that structure and keeping it cool, we're not winning. So just some different things to think about, especially when they talk about this case, because it gets brought up a lot. We're going to show, I think, two more fires in, in this slideshow where they did the exact same thing that Brian and his company did, where they made entry into this structure through the front door when you had fire in the rear. It's not uncommon. It's not something we practice as fire departments that often. A lot of times we go in through the front door and we don't talk about going to the rear. So it's just something we need to talk about more. When we talk about flashover, flashovers happen a lot more rapidly than they used to. Again, we talked about a room nowadays, under five minutes for a room to flashover compared to what it used to be years ago where it was closer to 20, 25 minutes. And that was a 10 by 10 room. 
some of the rooms, especially with the trust constructions that they're doing nowadays, you could have the whole first floor be one room. If that happens, that f spread of fire, spread of smoke, spread of heat is going to be more rapid because it's not in a compartment. It's not in a small 10 by 10 room. So when you get full involvement on a full floor like that, it's a lot more dangerous, not only for the people inside the structure because it can spread easier, but it's going to make it more difficult for us as the fire department showing up. When we talk about flashover, what is flashover? It means everything in that room has been brought to ignition temperature and ignites. Sometimes you'll hear people talk about, in, uh, yeah, the room flashed when I was in it, the room flashed when I was in it. If a room flashes while you're in it, how close do you need to be to the door to make it out and survive? What's that threshold? Right, within two, two to four feet of the door. And if you're any further, what are you? You're a statistic. You're not making it out. That's why for years, what did they teach us? If we go to the rear, we know we got a real bad kitchen, but we want to check by that door. What do they teach us to do with our foot? We hook the door, we, we lay on the floor, we do a quick search with our hands or our tool, do a sweep, and then we back out because by hooking the door, that gives us that little bit of area where we can still pull ourselves out even if the room flashes. Any further than that and you're just a, another number on the wall. That's all you are. That's something to make sure you pay attention to as a truck company. If you're going to go and you're going to do a search, especially on an upper floor, you don't have a line with you. Does it happen? Absolutely it does. It happens a lot. Make sure you make a commitment with that engine that's on the first floor. If I'm going upstairs and he's the engine company on the first floor, I need to let him know we're going upstairs to start our search. Now we've made a commitment to each other. He knows I'm upstairs. If something bad breaks bad before he exits that structure, he's going to make sure that I've made it out before he exits the building because he's got the guy with the guns. No different than if I decide to take a different way out of that structure. If I get to the second floor, it's bad. I go out a window. I go out another door. What's my responsibility? That commitment to him, I need to let him know we're out of the building. We're safe. Now, whatever's going on with him, if he needs to exit, he knows that he doesn't need to protect us anymore. But that commitment and that conversation between each other, if you're going to do that search without a line, is important. So your traditional fire behavior timeline and temperature line. This is what we all were taught that the fire goes through its different phases. At some point, we reach that oxygen deficiency phase sometimes when it doesn't have enough oxygen to keep burning going. When it does keep growing up that point, we do reach that, that flashover phase. What we're realizing nowadays is we're reaching it a lot sooner than what it used to be. The things I want you to pay attention to is when this room flashes, within five to ten seconds before it flashes, you'll start seeing the carpet off gas. And that is what we have to be concerned about. If we're ever doing a search and we start seeing a carpet off gas, we know that within five seconds that that room is going to light up. And if we're on it, we're part of that flashover. In a couple seconds, you'll start seeing the chair start to off gas. Now you'll start seeing the carpet. With us, sometimes it's difficult for us to pay attention to actually what's going on in front of us because we're so involved in the crawl. A lot of times as we're doing the fireman crawl, if we're doing it on our hands and knees, what happens to our heads sometimes is we're keeping it down and we're not kind of paying attention to what's going on in front of us because it's a little bit easier to crawl as opposed to like this when our, when our head is down. So sometimes we lose sight of actually what's going on. We're so focused on the crawl that we're doing. The other thing that we have to worry about is our gear. So a lot, have you ever had where you had got the gear on, you're in a hot position, and 10, 15 seconds later, you move weird in the gear, and you go, ooh, and you get that little burn or tingle when the gear actually touches your skin? What the gear is actually designed to do, I always thought it was designed to keep the heat away from you. What the gear is actually designed to do is it takes in that heat so it doesn't burn you. 
And that's why sometimes, it, by the time you realize how hot your gear is, you're 15, 20 seconds into where it was really bad at by the time you realize it. Because it's, it's sucking in that heat as you're going through. So it's something to pay attention to. If you start feeling your gear is that superheated gear, you're probably way further than you need to be. So your typical uh, fire behavior um, timeline now is what they're seeing is fires are burning so hot and so fast, it's sucking up all the oxygen in the room. And what it does is it reaches a certain temperature and then it starts to die out and it's, not, it's preventing it from actually finishing and getting to that flashover state. And then we show up because the temperature and everything is dropping because it's not getting that oxygen. And we show up. And what's the first thing we do when we show up? We open the front door. When we open the front door, what do we just do? We just ventilate. So by making sure we're doing a coordinated attack, is that a big deal? Absolutely not. It's not a big deal. We open the front door. We make room for the engine and the truck to be able to make their way down the hallway to get to the seat of the fire. Not a big deal. You get a good, aggressive A-team truck company and you got a C-team engine company, is it a big deal now? Absolutely it is because now we're venting the fire and we don't, we don't have water ready to go to actually put it out. So when we vent it, they're saying within 80 seconds of us opening that front door, we can reach that flashover state. This is that warehouse that we were talking about earlier. And in, in this warehouse, they light it up with, again, 20 pallets. That's all they have in there is 20 pallets. Now, if we pulled up and we saw this, this is four minutes into the incident. Would we send anyone to the roof? Probably not. This would probably be something that we're going to say we, we've lost the building and it's, it's past what we're capable of doing. How high is the roof? It's about two stories. We pulled up and we saw this. Would we send someone to the roof? I, I would guess probably, even if it's just to give us an idea of what's going on. Now that was 458, this is 510. Why is it so much better now compared to what it was, say, 20 seconds ago? It didn't run out of fuel, it ran out of oxygen. With the, it, it ran out of the amount of oxygen to sustain the uh, ability to keep burning the way that it is. And what will happen is, it, it, even at this, at 2 o'clock in the morning, does this look like that big of a deal? Probably not. Now, again, it, because it's starting to uh, make holes, it's right. It's, it's starting to, to release. And now, now you saw something like this, that there's a big difference. But again, while this was going on, at 16, 17 minutes, floor temperatures were at 80, 90 degrees. What they did was they built this firewall here, and then they did this side of it, and they left this big door open. And this one collapsed, I think, at 20 minutes, and they were trying to say, okay, this would be at 2 o'clock in the morning when the business is all closed up, no one's there, it starts on fire. The one on the other side, they left the door open saying, this is 2 o'clock in the afternoon, a fire started in the structure, everyone's leaving. How fast did that one collapse? <coughs> within 10 minutes because it had that flow of oxygen all the way through it and it wasn't enclosed like the other one. So those, those are concerns and worries that we, we have to have. This is in Bensonville. Uh, for the Bensonville fire, what they ended up doing was they took this townhome. They put a couch on the first floor, and they have absolutely nothing to burn on the second floor. 
And they put, uh, what you're seeing is all those sensors um, on the outside of the structure. And they wanted to check about this limited oxygen thing that's going on with fires. And they're saying, well, why is, the, the, what effect are we having with what's going on with the oxygen levels of, of the building when we show up and we ventilate the structure? How is it changing what it looks like? All right, we pull up on the scene. Where are we thinking that the fire is for this? Second floor. Are we that worried about it? What does it look like? Would we maybe not even drop a line, take a hand can in there, see what's going on? Maybe? Possibly. Okay, at this point, we got a little bit thicker smoke and maybe, again, I would think it was on the second floor with the amount of smoke that's coming out that second floor window. I would probably at this point drop a line. At this point, we know we got a good work and fire. Look at the smoke coming from around the door. Look at it starting to die out a little bit though. Change in color. Do anything open on the, on the back side? Nope, just this one window. That's all that's open is this one window. You pull up there. It, would anyone be worried about what they saw at this point? doesn't look like any smoke's coming out of the building. Compared to what it was 30 seconds ago, is this night and day? For me, I probably wouldn't even take my helmet off the dash. We'd probably go open the door and see what's going on. Now look at the change when he opened that door. And within less than 90 seconds, you're going to see he's got a rip, roar, and fire in there. New York, like I said, had numerous incidents like this, and they couldn't figure out why when the truck company was showing up on the scene, they said we had light smoke, nothing major. They popped the front door. They shot up the staircase to go do a search in the bedroom. By the time they got up there to start the searches, mm -hmm. things broke bad within 80 to 90 seconds, and they were having guys getting injured and guys getting killed, and they couldn't figure out why. And what they're seeing is it's this limited air that's happening to the fires and it's sitting in that point waiting for us to ventilate it. And what they're realizing is you can have a real good aggressive truck company. You can have a real good aggressive engine company. If they're not working together, together if they're not coordinating their tactics on where they're ventilating how they're ventilating and what things are going on and what's happening this is the kind of stuff that can happen so there has to be that communication there has to be that respect for the other person's job and who's ready to do what at the fire scene this is Dalton This is a basement fire, early morning. A 
Again, for a basement fire, do we want to ventilate that front window? Even if we are going to ventilate and we ventilate in the wrong place, we should probably ventilate the whole window. Even if we're going to do it wrong, let's at least do it right wrong. We still don't even have a charged hose line. We've got two engine company guys in the house on air with no charged hose line and we got the truck company ventilating. Is there anything coordinated about that? If this was our house, we turned a basement fire into what? Again, bad guys, no, not bad guys, just not coordinated, just bad tactics, just not breaking everything down to where it's supposed to be. And that looks like about 20 gallons of water a minute. <laughs> ben, see, that explains it. When we did about Three years ago, we did a truck company class for the city, and one of the big things that we talked about was guys stopping to take, a, not taking out that huge picture window anymore, and ventilating. We had a we had a fire in the rear. We should be taking out rear windows first because we don't want to draw the fire and draw the heat and smoke towards that engine company that's coming in. We want to try and ventilate from behind the fire. So as we're working our way down the hallway, that's the way that the flow path is going to work for us. And you would swear we just ran over their puppy with the, with the truck. That For years, that's what everyone had done. You take out the big, pretty picture window. It makes a lot of noise, makes a huge vent hole. It absolutely does. There's nothing wrong with taking out further into the fire to help ventilate. But if we're going to do that, we need to ventilate behind the fire first to make it easier for that engine company. We don't want to draw it towards the engine company. We do have to pay attention to the flow paths that are happening with the structure. We want to make it easy for, easier for us, not, not make it more difficult. And again, this is not a new concept, you know, with all these NIST things that are coming out. Not bad things that they're doing. I think they're, they're, whether you agree with them di or disagree with them, it really doesn't matter. But I think it's important to get conversations going about what's happening at fire scenes. This was in 1866. The door should be kept shut while the water is being brought and the air excluded as much as possible as the fire burns exactly in proportion to the quantity of air which it receives. Is that new? Did it take any computerized programs for a guy in 1866 to come up with this idea? He understood it then, that if we limit the oxygen, we do coordinated attacks. If that truck company works with that engine company, we can do a better job of keeping our fires under control with that coordinated attack. If we just ventilate just to ventilate and we don't have that engine company that's ready to go, we're going to make things worse. When we ventilate, we need to venerate, ventilate in the proper spaces. Um, just because we're doing an eight hour class in about three and a half hours, we're going to skip some of the videos. But this video shows a young guy, they got a fire down here in this area, a young guy comes around the side of the building and pops all these windows. What do you think happens when he does that? Each one, as it goes along, it just lights up because it has the, all the fuel up there it needs. It has all the heat up there that it needs. It needed the oxygen. When he took out those windows, he gave it exactly what it wanted. <coughs> he turned a basement fire into, they burned this whole house down. So some of the signs that we need to worry about and we need to look for is the way that the smoke is exiting the structure. It, through the doors, through the windows, what type of push, what type of color, what things are happening with that smoke as it's exiting the structure? How much pressure is it under? Is it pulsating? What does pulsating smoke usually tell us? It's oxygen starved and we could be going into some type of backdraft situation. 
when we got those heavily stained windows. That's letting us know there's a lot of soot, there's a lot of product on the inside of that structure, and we need to be worried about that because that's all that fuel that it needs to start burning. And then auto ignition, when it reaches that correct oxygen temperature and it brings it down into that flammable range, we're going to get auto ignition on the outside of that structure. That auto ignition, we're going to see those brief bursts of flames as the gases, as that smoke is exiting windows or doorways. If we do a sudden change in smoke color, that could be good, that could be bad. If we're winning and that smoke gets lighter, that's a good thing. If we got our guys inside the structure and they're not winning and smoke's changing color, that's a bad thing for all of us. When that smoke layers actually are, are dropping, and things are getting worse as we're moving through the building. It's important as the engine company, we're cooling down those layers as they're dropping. The more time we get it to increase its, its um, flammable range, the more of an opportunity it has for that room to flash over that we're trying to get through. <coughs> and when we see something off-gassing, we know that flashover is imminent. It's happening within three to five seconds of that off-gassing. This was in Toronto. This started out when they arrived on the scene as a garage, attached garage fire. When they opened the front door, the truck company shot directly upstairs to go do searches because of the time of day it was. Not a bad move. I can't blame them at all for doing that. The engine company didn't have their ducks in a row. They didn't have their line in place. When they opened that front door, they did exactly what we just saw at that Benson building. They had 80 to 90 seconds. It chased them right up the stairs, and you see it looks like a clown car, all of them jumping out the window now, because it got so intense. It was a big foyer opening in the front of the uh, building here, and it ran right up the staircase from the garage when it got that oxygen that it needed. So we just need to make sure that we're coordinating what we're doing and how we're going about it. Is there anyone that has an issue or a problem with them handing that line upstairs to kind of keep things in control up on that second floor? I don't have an issue with it. When it's that bad where we're jumping out windows, we need to do everything we possibly can to cool it down to get our guys out of there. This is about the gear again. This was a line of duty death that happened um, for a volunteer firefighter. He ended up, uh, this is what his gear is left over. And this is what we talked about earlier about the mass, about them starting to deform at such an early temperature. Someone was saying in uh, Saturday's class that we did that uh, MSA is coming out with a new one that I guess can do five, 600. Again, what are the temperatures of the rooms that we're going in? Are we in rooms that are over five, 600 degrees? Yeah, so even if, even if they raise it to say 600 compared to the four, two, 300 or 400 that it is now, yeah, it's nice, but how much more money is it gonna be and how much more protection does it really give us? Our tactical options when things start, start to get bad with the, with the heat that we're inside the structure with, when we've got that, that fuel that's rolling above our head, we have a couple choices. We either need to ventilate it to get it out of the house, we need to cool it down with the water that we have, or we need to get out of Dodge. Those are our options. Because if we leave that fuel inside that little box, it's eventually going to light up and it's going to hurt us. When we pull up and we're doing our tactical size up, reading the smoke and the fire conditions gives us an idea of what tactics we're going to do. Gives us an idea of where the burning is happening and what areas are still uh, in, uh, safe where the fire hasn't gained access yet. Things we have to be concerned about is have the smoke and the fuel in the smokes reach those areas of that structure or households. Wind speeds can have a big effect. There are a bunch of classes going around now where they talk about the wind-driven fires. Do wind-driven fires only happen in high-rises? Absolutely not. Second-story, two-story buildings, you can have wind-driven fires on. 
Well, that's something we need to pay attention to. There have been a couple line of duty deaths in New York uh, for second story apartment buildings where they've had wind driven fires. When do wind driven fires usually happen? What happen? What time of type of what time of year? Right, r right now. Sometime the most line of duty deaths for wind driven fires have happened between December and March. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So th th those are those are situations that, that we have to be worried about. What type? What type? What's uh, mm -hmm. wind speeds do they have in Boston? What was it? Sixty miles an hour. Yeah, so so th th those type of situations we have to pay attention to, um, even for a, a two-story uh, dwelling. If at all possible, if we're waiting for that engine company to get the line to us, we can close doors, we can keep it in check. By closing doors, it buys us a little bit of time and prevents that fire from spreading to other areas of the house. When you decide to be venting, don't just break to break. Make sure you have a purpose for where you're venting and how you're venting these structures. Make sure you're getting the advantage on these structures and you're paying attention to the sights and sounds of the fire scenes. Where do we have fire at for this structure? Sector three, Charlie, right? It's in the rear of the household. What type of construction would we say this is? It's probably, I would probably go with lightweight, especially it looks like a newer built home. Um, when we look at this pad here, what does it look like they possibly did? They took that garage, converted it into a living space. So will we probably guess there's trusses up in that attic space area? I would bet that. Now this is a residential home with fire in the Charlie. This is basically, other than having someone inside the structure, this is basically the <coughs> Brian Carey fire. Would we all agree? It's the same thing all over again. We have smoke showing out the front of the house. So I would guess it's probably in this attic space. And the way that it's running up the, the roof line there, I would probably guess it's in that attic space also. They circle the windows here. I think, I, I don't like using this because from this picture, I can't tell if it's just the way the picture is taken or if they're actually dark from smoke. When we look at this side, side B, look at the vent hole, the smoke coming out of that vent hole. What type of velocity is coming out of that? Look at that push. Would you want to be standing in front of that? What's, going to, what's probably going to happen in that attic space very shortly? Probably a flashover. We, we, we would probably all agree. It's pushing hard. That's the rear of the house. Would anyone have an issue with taking a line to the rear, giving it a quick hit? Probably not a bad move. Throwing it at 100, 150, 200 gallons of water towards the back. Where did they take their first line? In through the front door, just like Brian did, right? With the amount of fire that we have over our head there, if we don't get water on it soon, what, what, what do we basically have? A huge loss here, right? That's a lot of fire above our heads. Still no water. And now we're backing out. The only difference between this fire and Brian's fire was nobody died and there wasn't a person that they said were still inside the structure. But they had fire in Sector 3 or Charlie. They entered the front door with a hand line and they lost. So the only big difference is that we have a lot, when people beat up Brian and them about why would they go into the front door, they had fire in Sector 3, why would they go into the front door? These guys just did the exact same thing. The only difference was no one died. They pulled them out before someone actually died. I, the only reason why I think that is because they didn't get deep enough in there. When we talk about ventilation and we talk about different things that can go, go wrong, we can pick a wrong location for us to actually do some of the ventilation that we're doing. We can mistime the ventilation hole. If, uh, there's a great video out there that New York has from probably 25 years ago at least where it shows a truck guy up on a little uh, roof. They have a second floor fire for a bedroom and he's in uh, Charlie. And he's up on top of the roof with a fireman and he calls for the engine company and he goes, do you have water yet? And the engine goes, no, stand by. 
and he waits. And the, he, you can tell that the fireman that he's with wants to break the window, and it, it's a lieutenant. He said, hold on, hold on, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait 25, 30 seconds. And because they d did such a good job with filming this, you can actually start hearing the engine company working their way down that hallway. And he says, all right, take the window. He takes the window, it lights up within 10, 15 seconds, and within 10 seconds of that, the fire's out. That's good coordinated attack. That's understanding when to ventilate, the sights and sounds. How many guys, as soon as they would have got to the roof, would have done what? Pop that window right now. Would we have made it easier or harder for that truck company? We would have made it harder. Brian Scott, who I teach this class with a lot, he's a chief out in Evanston, tells a story when he was a, a younger fireman. He was the outside vent man. He was sent around to sector three. The engine company was having issues with water. He kind of leaned up against the building before he vented the back windows and he was waiting for that engine company to get in place. A chief came around the side of the building, saw him standing abs doing absolutely nothing on the outside of the building. The chief lost his mind yelling and screaming at him. What are you doing? You're supposed to be the outside vent man. Vent, vent, vent. Brian let him scream and yell for a few minutes. Didn't argue with him, waited a little bit. By then, the engine company got to what it needed to do, and he ventilated the building. Having that discipline is such a big part of proper ventilation. Understanding when, why, and how is a big part of it. Again, flashovers happen in their full room. It's everything that's in the room is lit up. If we're in the room also, we're part of that flashover. If we're not very close to that doorway, we're not going to make it out the body's gonna shut down. For flame over or rollover, sometimes flame over or rollover is confused with flashover. We see flame over or rollover, that's when we get that roll above that ceiling where things are, the smokes and everything starting to light up above our head. That's not a flashover. That's just the smoke is reaching the correct oxygen temperature and it's in that flammable range where it's starting to light up above our heads. We can do something about that. We can cool it down with that line. We can make sure it, it lowers that temperature so it doesn't hurt us and doesn't get behind us. Rollover can cause fires in other rooms of the house. You can have so much rollover happening that it lights up the smoke in other rooms depending on how far that rollover actually goes. Different things we can do to kind of help control that uh, rollover or flame over from ha happening. We can ventilate. We can cause some of that those superheated gases to actually exit the structure so they're not rolling down, down the hallway. We can change the oxygen by limiting the amount of holes that we put in the structure. We can also cool it down, which brings it below ignition temperature. In this video, you'll actually watch the instructor um, He's talking about flame over and rollover with the candidates that he's with, and he'll do that penciling light that we were talking about earlier. And again, that's okay to do during training, but we don't want to do it on actual fire scenes. This is a great video to show and talk about what happened with Brian. When Brian was penciling, what happened every 10 to 15 seconds? Everything was getting just as hot above his head because look what's happening here. This is just a little hallway. This isn't even filled with that thick black smoke like we were talking with Brian. This is why we don't pencil inside the structures. If we needed to make this hallway and we had rollover above our head, if the two guys who are trying to make the hallway on that line open that inch and three quarter hand line and move down the hallway, should we be able to do that? Is that a realistic thing to do? If him and I cannot move an inch and three quarter hand line down a hallway open, should we be in this job? 
I mean, it's 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 really that simple. That that, that that's what we should be able to do. It's not rocket science. We should be able to move an inch three quarter hand line wide open right down a hallway and get to the seat of the fire. How many times have we heard you got to make the turn? They can pour water in this hallway all they want. For the next 10 minutes, they could throw 1,000 gallons of water in this hallway. Are they going to put out the fire? No, because they didn't make the turn, right? So if we make, make the environment safer to make that turn while we're getting down there, does that make it easier and better for us? If I can lower the temperature, say, from 1,000 degrees to 400 degrees or 300 degrees while we're moving down above our heads, is that better? I think so. I think it makes it easier for us to make that hallway. A handful of us have probably been through one of the flashover simulators, and one of the things that they talk about with the flashover simulators is we should probably really call them flameover or rollover simulators. Because the idea or concept of flashover is everything in the room ignites. If we were inside one of those trailers and it was a true flashover, we would be on f fire too. Sometimes, whether it's the burn tower or flashover simulators or anything like that, sometimes we get a false sense of security, especially as a new guy. When we go to burn towers, especially when we're going through the academy nowadays, how hot do those burn towers get? When you go down to IFSI and you go through those burn towers, they get pretty hot now. They get them rocking nowadays. It gives you a false sense of security. If you're in a real two and a half story frame where fires are that hot and intense in a room, should you be there? But as a new guy, what do you know? If you haven't been to very many residential structure fires, you've said, I've been here before. It's okay for me to be here. I've felt this before because we did this in the burn tower. This is what I was taught. We've been in this before. Look at my helmet. I got the melted shield in, in the burn tower. It's, it's, it's okay for me to be here. And it's a false sense of security. Also with that, everyone's definition of what hot is is different depending on how many fires you've been to, depending on what situations you've been put in, you can ask five different people what hot is, and you're going to get five different answers on what they're able to accept and what they're able to do. On the engine company that I was on, uh, there were th in the 10 years that I was there, we went through three different officers um, on my shift. One of the officers that we had on, on our shift when he first got there, he was one of these guys who never wore his hood. That's your prerogative if you don't want to wear your hood. I always wore my hood because my belief was that if I'm on the pipe and I can move that nozzle 10 times faster down a hallway because I got my hood up, it's better for everyone at the fire scene. The first two or three fires we had together, he would said, stop, 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 I got to put my hood up. That lasted two fires. I told him afterwards, you know I wear mine. So if you know I wear mine and you know we're going to move faster and when we're going to get deeper faster, then what should you do? You, you got to pull your hood up. Because we, we can't stop because now we're wasting time. And it, from that point on, he's, he, he's a captain now. He always wears his hood because it lets him move 10 times faster. Backdrafts. Has anyone in the room actually ever seen a backdraft? They don't happen very often. We don't see backdrafts happen very often. And basically what happens is, is everything in the house reaches at that certain temperature. There's so much heat and there's so much smoke in it. Again, we're losing that ability for the building to get the oxygen that it needs to su sustain combustion. So some of the, sometimes you'll see that you'll get those puffings out the side of the building. Or you'll get the windows where it looks like that they're weeping on the windows. You'll, sometimes they say you hear a whistling. The only times from the videos that I've seen, the only time you ever see the whistling is just seconds before that it actually pops. And this is basically your timeline for how a uh, backdraft works. The reason why it says backdraft and not draft is because it's an English slide. But th this is what they're saying basically happens with the backdraft. We ventilate or open it and we cause the backdraft to happen. There's a rapid increase in pressure and that happens. There's your math for the day. Basically what happens, you open the door it blows fuel-rich gases out the, the top of the door while it's sucking in air at the bottom. And we've all seen that in fires, right? When we've opened the front door, we let it burp. And as we start making that hallway in, we're actually seeing fresh air suck in at the bottom as it's rolling out the top. 
where the backdraft, once it does that, and it happens very fast, is you start getting that fresh air and the hot fuels and gases mixed at a certain point in the house, which creates a fireball. As that fireball starts up in the structure, it actually flames the hot superheated gases and blows out the structure. This is a basement fire in New York where a backdraft happened. So we need to pay attention to the things that we're doing because we can actually cause a backdraft to happen. If we see a house that's all locked up, most times for backdrafts, you're going to see where there's not fire on the inside of the house. You might see it on the outside, but most times for a backdraft, it's because the house is enclosed where you're not going to actually see fire on the inside. When we look at structures like this, and we have the possibility of a backdraft happening. Different things that we're going to see. Um, building appears like it's breathing. We talked about the pressurized uh, smoke and the uh, whistling sound that you may hear. No visible flames from the inside of the building, maybe some from the outside. Your doors and windows are very, very hot. And you're going to see that stained or cracked look on the windows from the soot. For us as a fire department, what are things we can do to try to prevent the backdraft from happening once we arrive on the scene? Vent high. We want to vent high. We're going to send people to the roof, maybe work, depending on the type of situation we're in, maybe work off a stick or some type of uh, basket, maybe break a skylight. One thing we're going to do to help protect our guys is we want to make sure we have a line up there because what's the possibility of happening with that smoke? It could light up right away as soon as it exit that, well, exits that structure. So we want to have a line in place to protect them while they're doing that ventilation. Say you can't get to the roof. Say the roof's bad. For whatever reason, you can't get to the roof. Other options that we could do is maybe put a um, master stream line in the front of the building. If we open up that master stream line with everyone in a safe place and we hit a window, if that window is superheated, when that water hits the window, it's probably going to happen. It's probably going to pop. Now we have a lot, heavy, copious amounts of water shooting in through the window while that backdrop <coughs> is actually happening. For whatever reason, we can't use a master stream to make this happen. If we have to do it with a pike pole or something, we stand off to the side and we do it and we hit it and we turn away as we do it. That would be the third option if that was our only choices. If you'll see the smoke coming in from right around here, you'll see it blow out, and then you'll see it suck in real fast. And they realized they had a backdraft happen, so they set up master streams right away. reason why you see it puff in and puff out the way that you do, and they're saying this red uh, line shows that it's sucking in for the oxygen, it gets the oxygen, then it dies down again. This was a fire that happened in Inglewood. This was a coach house. The reason why they believe that this backdraft happened was because we changed our tactics. Our normal operations for our first truck company is what? You go to the roof. Because it was a coach house, they ended up doing uh, horizontal ventilation as opposed to vertical ventilation on this structure. 
It changed the way that we do things on a norm. It changed our tactics. The house had also been remodeled about 60 times because, again, they had multiple different people living there. The remodels didn't meet the codes. They had multiple ceilings. So it didn't allow for proper um, spacing between the, the ceilings and, and things to be done in the proper way. So it had lots of void spaces in it. While he's working on this piece of wood, you can actually see as he's pulling on it, the way that it puffs, depending on when he does the pull. <laughs> we were very lucky with this one. We're lucky we didn't kill four to six guys with this one. The kid who was on the ladder took burns to his face. I think it was off for about six months. He's back to work now, but. Different ideas, again, we talked about for uh, trying to deal with the backdraft is we can flank the fire with uh, different lines, making sure we're getting people out of the blast zones. Someone said you guys still have a piercing nozzle. It's an option uh, using for the structure itself, putting a piercing nozzle into the structure. We want to ventilate high if at all possible. You guys have one? Somewhere. Yeah. So I, it's, it, it, I, yeah. But it, it's, it's an option, so there, there are different ideas and different concepts you can use, use for it. Um, if at all possible, though, we want to ventilate high. The differences between a backdraft and a smoke explosion. Sometimes they're difficult to tell the difference on what's going on and what's happening. The biggest things that I can tell you for the difference between a backdraft and a smoke explosion, smoke explosions usually happen in a smaller confined area, whether it's a ceiling space, or it's just one room. Uh, someone told a story at one of the classes that we were at where as a young candidate he was told to go into a bedroom and take down the ceiling. Went in there, started popping the ceiling with his pike pole, put five or six nice holes in the ceiling, and the whole ceiling just went boom and all fell. Well, the officer came running back in there and went, good job, kid. The whole ceiling had come down. When they went back and looked at it afterwards, there was actually a smoke explosion. It, again, they had done construction in, in the building. That one little room in that little ceiling space it had all the superheated gases. He put enough holes in it and added the oxygen and it dropped the whole ceiling. He looked like a great fireman for about 30 seconds until they realized what, what had actually happened. But it, it's one of those things that happens in a smaller confined area. Lots of void spaces that are interconnected that are going to be the causes of it. The smoke and he heavy heat is going to travel to different areas in those confined spaces and then it'll migrate out to the other areas. This is one of those smoke explosions and uh, this is done off the cam of a police car. You'll see it actually lift the roof off the house. <laughs> this was a fire that happened in Colorado and due to the void spaces in between the structures themselves they actually had a smoke explosion in the building next door to it
basically it, it had multiple ceilings. There was a space between the two buildings, and that was the end result. That was an exposure too. So it, it blew the entire roof off. That was the void space that they were talking about, where it sent it through. For the guys that are really into the building constructions and stuff like this, what are these called? Fire cuts, right. What's the reason that fire cuts are put in some of the, the buildings? So when, when the ceilings drop, it doesn't push the walls up. That's why we put the fire cuts in there. Sometimes you'll see them, sometimes you don't. What happened between these two is this one did not have the fire cuts. It caused the void space. And that's the, they're saying how it leaked into the different area. What I'm guessing, if you look at, it looks like they probably have an attic fire, but that's balloon construction. So my guess is it probably started in the basement, ran that wall. They got up to that attic space because they had companies inside working. They probably got up to that attic space. They probably opened the door to that attic space, and it probably gave it enough oxygen where it popped the way that it did. What do you think the pucker factor was for those guys? <laughs> This was a training drill. There are lots of these that fly around roof, uh, YouTube that happen uh, with trainings. And sometimes what happens is, you know, we do the first light up and everything kind of goes real smooth. So the second time we do it, what do we do? We make it a little hotter. We get it a, a little juicier. Then the third time we do it, what do we do? Well, we got to make it a little bit better than the second time. And that's usually when stuff like this happens. If you watch the firefighters on the scene, no one really looks in a panic here. Everyone's kind of, you know, moving a little slowly. It's almost like they know what's going on. They've got a good, good handle on it. They got a good control on it. Look at the weeping smoke from the brick lines. My guess with the ladders, they probably already got someone on the roof. So when we talk about understanding the fire behavior and the reading smoke, when we look at this building, what type of building is this? What type of construction? <coughs> it, it, could, it could be brick. What else could it also be? Veneer. Brick veneer. Mm -hmm. And what's one of those ways that sometimes that we can tell? It's not always 100%, but it, the difference between brick and brick veneer on the outside, what do they do? They put the soldiers in there, right? And that's where they lay the bricks a different way, about, what is it, every seventh row or something, where the bricks are aligned in, in, in a different direction. And that gives us an idea sometimes, the a difference between brick or brick veneer. Why is that important for us? Would you, right, would you rather be in a brick or a brick veneer building? I'd rather be in a brick building. We've got more time then, right? It, it buys us time. When we look at this building, 
This is probably a single family dwelling, but with the way the garages are, could it be a two family dwelling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, w I would say there's a possibility for it. I would guess that we took out the windows, but can we see a difference in the smoke that's coming out if we said this was um, A side and this was B side, a difference in the colors of, of the smokes? Do, do we have more concern on this side? with the colors that are coming out as opposed to here where it's kind of just rolling up over the top. Those are, those are concerns that we have to have when we're looking at the smoke. It's something we need to address. And if the people that are inside the structure of command doesn't know that there's a difference, it's something we need to talk about and tell. When we talk about the building of the houses that we do nowadays, what are, what are some of our concerns with the way that they're, they're built? What's the big differences, the way that they enclose them? They're airtight, which increases our chances for what? Flashovers, right? When they're airtight like that, what are some other concerns with this insulation that they use? Is it very flammable? Some of, it, some of them are. Some of them, if you light them up, they, they, they can burn all, all by themselves, just like if we, if we lit up a table, they light, they light up like that. For the houses that they're building now, when you had a house that was built, say, 25 years ago, you walked in the front door, you had a front room, you had three bedrooms, you had a bathroom, you had a kitchen, that was it. Now, main floors, what are they doing to a lot of those old homes? They put a second floor on it, they open up that main floor completely so it's one big room. Does that make it more difficult for us as firefighters to fight the fire? Absolutely, because it's not in, in a compartment. So we talked about open floor plan, open floor plans having faster growth. It, it makes uh, things change more rapidly. It makes it more difficult for us to ventilate in the proper places. We also have higher fuel loads. Think of grandma's house 25, 30 years ago. What did she have in her front room? A couch, a chair, maybe a table, maybe a TV, right? Right. Now, how many TVs do we have in our houses? Right. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's more TVs than we can even imagine. Think of our kids' toys. 25, 30 years ago, there were a lot of toys that were made out of wood. Kids definitely didn't have half the stuff that they have now. If you took all your kids' toys that were plastic or made out of some type of oil-based product and put them in the front lawn, you probably wouldn't have a front lawn anymore. So your traditional t timeline for your, your fires is one that we saw 150 times probably going through firefighter two school and going through classes for everything that we've seen throughout the years. This was our normal timeline. When they're looking at those ventilation limited fires that where we showed that Bensonville fire and a couple of those other ones, this is what we're looking at. There's the sudden growth and then it stops because it loses the oxygen, it drops down. And then when we get here, we get that rapid growth again. This again, what goes back to that coordinated attack, making sure that engine and truck company is working together, making sure we're ventilating at the proper time. This was a training fire, this was six seconds into it. They popped the door, this was six seconds after they popped the door. This was 48 seconds after they popped the door. We stu still do not have a charge hose line. Two minutes later, we turned a small little training fire into we don't have a training house anymore. We've all probably seen this video a hundred times from the UL studies. They're calling this legacy. This was grandma's house where the furniture inside this structure was your typical pillows were filled with horse hair. This is all your man-made plasticky materials that they do nowadays. And yes, plasticky is an actual term. 
That's a minute and a half into it. Both of these are probably still hand can fires. Yeah, and like you said, it'd probably be worse if we had another wall here. But this, the smoke is actually rolling out, going into this huge warehouse that both of these were built in. Shortly you'll start seeing the carpet off gas in the next, I think, 35 seconds. It's amazing the amount of smoke, even if we don't look at the fire, it's amazing the difference in the amount of smoke that it gives off and how much of that thick product. That uh, grandma's house, the legacy one, that's still a hand can fire. You go in there with five gallons of water, that fires out. Yeah. Grandma probably wouldn't even have called you. She probably would have brought a pot full of water and thrown it on the couch, and that would have been the end of it. So the modern room flashed over in 340. It took 28 uh, minutes for the legacy room to flash over. So that's a big difference in time frames for what's going on. Another one of those that they had heavy fire in sector three. No one checked out the rear of the building. They didn't drop a line to the rear. They went straight in through the front door. It's company 182311, Fairfax Engine 439, Truck 11. Fairfax Squad 439, Ambulance 13, your second call, Battalion Chief 602, response 6 Delta, Block 2203, House Fire. Two story single family dwelling, confirming a working structure fire, number two floor. Organized established command. Need to transfer it ASAP. And the fire actually okay. started there's a drill underneath one, that deck. That, that, that's that. why they showed that. Now, well, safety 601, the call middle of the court is going to be for a work instruction fire. Okay, rescue 13, 13, 12. Okay, 
Okay, Chief, look, 1313. Well, and again, with the amount of fire that's in Sector 3, if someone would have looked around the side of the building, would it be that crazy to think you're going to take a line to the rear, throw some water on the back of the building? Would we have made things a little bit easier for us to go inside and do an interior attack? Okay, medic one three one. Okay, chief eleven, I copy that. Thirteen fourteen. Now, you as being on the outside of the structure, they say they have a fire in the attic. Would you say there's a lot more going on here than that? And just a fire in an, a in an attic space? We can have a room water at the end of the fourth. I have another hydrant in front of 4324 to get in front of the engagement of the place. Now, you as the engine company, you're saying your visibility is zero. I have no idea if we're winning or losing. Should that be sending some signals off in your head? The smoke exiting the windows, how it's changed, how thick and black it is. I mean, we've been, we're 15 minutes in and we've gotten no better. Rescue 13 is on the thing. Okay, rescue 13, 13, 16. Okay, safety six on one thirteen six. Okay. We'll, we'll stop that there because th there are a couple issues with that. When we have a writ evacuation, evacu <laughs> when we have a mayday, are we supposed to evacuate the building? No, we're still supposed to do what? Still doing our jobs till we can get the guys out of the building. That's our number one priority. Because if we're actually making some progress in the area we're working, and you call the May Day and we leave what we're doing, we just made ten times worse things ten times worse for you. It's not uncommon for that to happen, though. We've heard that numerous times at other incidents um, where th th that has happened. The other thing is you are the guys with the answer w with that line. If things are that bad... When you said we have zero visibility and things are bad, we open the line and what do we do? We exit the building, right? We, we get out of Dodge. If things are that bad, is that difficult sometimes for an engine company to do, to accept that we're going to back out of a building? Sometimes it's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard to be able to ex accept that that's what we're going to do. So 
And just, an, again, another one of those incidents where another Brian Carey, no one died on this one. A couple guys had some basic burns with, with this one, but no one died. But again, we had heavy fire in Sector 3. No one acknowledged it. We, we, we didn't acknowledge, and there's a possibility that we can make things a little bit easier and better for us if we throw 100, 200 gallons of water back there. Again, another 1866, the door should be kept shut while the water is being brought and the air excluded as much as possible as the fire burns mm -hmm. exactly in proportion to the quantity of air in which it receives. Nothing new there. We know that if we limit the amount of air that we're given the fire, if we do coordinated attacks, things will get better. If we break down how we're going to coordinate that, that attack, it's, it's not rocket science. It doesn't take difficult for us to keep the communication flowing and going and have things working where we're coordinating things together. A lot of times it doesn't even have to be done over the radio. If you're an engine company and a truck company working on the inside of the house, a lot of the things <coughs> can be discussed while we're screaming back and forth to each other. We, we talked about the vent enter search. About two more slides, guys. I don't know if you can see him hanging out the window. This is the New York guy. He's, he's right there hanging in the window. He's trying to get out. His air pack's caught on the window, and he's, he's trying to fall out the window. He, he can't get himself through, through the window because he can't see. His face mask uh, glossed over. He didn't even know the ladder was there. He was just jumping for his life. When he tells the story about this after it happened, he ended up living through this. But when he tells the story about it, what basically happened was they went up to the second floor. Engine company went towards the back of the building. He went towards the front. He was doing a basic search. That was basically like a front room area. Um, he sh shot towards the front, started doing a search. As he got towards where those windows are, it got super hot. He, he, he realized how hot it was. What does a truck guy do when he feels that it's super hot? We ventilate, right? Mm -hmm. He started ripping down the blinds from his knees. He ripped down all the blinds, ripped down the drapes, and started popping the windows. As he popped the windows, what he didn't realize was that he was giving it the oxygen that it needed. It had that superheated, thick black smoke all sitting in that room. As soon as he started popping those windows, he got to the second window and it flashed. Well, his only thought process was, there's no way I can make it back. So he was going to dive out the window. As he was trying to dive out the window, they were thin windows. They were thin windows, and as he said his face piece for his mask glossed over right away. And he said he just couldn't get his body through the thing, because he said he was just going to die for his life. He figured it was better than the room he was in. He had no idea the ladder was there. When he hit the ladder, he was shocked. He had no idea it was there. So it, that had been something he had done 100 times before. He had gone into a front room or another area of the house. He knew the line was up on the second floor with him. It got hot in the room. He decided, I'm going to ventilate. The line's in place. Didn't realize that how bad the, uh, the smoke was in that room. Was there a sign guy with him? No? no, he went off by himself. The other guys went with the line. He shot off into that room to go do a search. Uh, can I ask what happened to the line going the opposite way? They, they were chasing the fire. OK. 
there was actually a fire in another part of that apartment. He was just, there was no fire in that front room. He, he would just shot in there to do a basic search. He figured, the line's on the same floor with me, I'm safe. They're going to hit the fire. I'm in a good spot. Did they have to back out? No, they actually, if you see what, when, when, they, when they started pulling him out the window, you, you saw the line come from the back all the way to the front, and you see it starting to cool it off, and the, and the fire actually goes out just as he's coming out the window. So some of the myths that we used to talk about and we used to hear is we never put water through a window. We can put water through a window, we just have to respect it, we have to do it the correct way. We have to follow the proper rules so we don't change conditions on the inside. Anyone that's ever been in a building when it's not done the correct way and you get that, that superheated gases coming down, back down the hallway at you, it hurts. It hurts and we need to pay attention to that and respect that. We don't have to attack from the unburned side. We understand now that we can actually attack the fire and sometimes make it a little bit easier and better for a quicker knockdown if we attack it from the burn side. A lot of times we can use some of the same tactics. Don't always and never with any of the fires that you go to. Have options, have different ways of doing do things. Have a Rolodex full of ideas and concepts that we can do and go through when we're at these structure fires. That's it. Questions? comments. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for uh, participating and being so considerate with, to me while I was here. Thank you.